Thanks for coming. Uh, I was going to make a joke, like, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today, because it does feel like a wedding room, doesn't it? Uh, just by way of getting to know you a little bit, by the way, my name's Eric Carter. I'm uh, uh, on the product marketing team at Sysdig. I'm joined with Alex, who's our principal security architect. I brought him along. He wasn't on the, the schedule, but that's because he can answer the hard questions, and I, I typically can't. But we want to talk to you a little bit about container security. Now, how many folks in here identify mostly as developer? Yeah, any like uh, more like the DevOps kind of people, or if you consider that different? Any, anything else further, like right, security or operation platform operators? Okay, so we got a good, a good mix of people. Um, part of our goal today is to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing in the industry around container security problems, to also talk about uh, some of the best practices that you can do when you're building containers, and then we will delve into a little bit on, uh, you know, because that's a lot of shift left stuff. We'll delve a bit into what we, we like to call shield right, uh, which is when your containers are running, what are some of the things you can do? And we will remind you, and most of you probably saw or heard the news, we'll remind you of the integration that we've done, uh, Sysdig with Docker Scout, to provide some additional uh, help for prioritizing security issues, CVEs, things that, uh, you know, you might be having a tough time figuring out which ones do I fix first. What we call Runtime Insights is going to help with that, so we'll, we'll deliver that message as well. Are we up? We're up. All right. Great. Uh, so we will, we will uh, we'll hightail it through, and I'm going to just not count on the clicker because it's not, I don't think it's connected, but okay. So you're going to connect it. All right. So I mentioned we're going to talk about the container security model. Somehow in the, out there it said container personnel or security personnel. Don't worry about it, you're in the, hopefully you're in the right place. Awesome. Uh, and just we'll go, we've already introduced ourselves roughly, so we'll get into that. Um, so we're gonna cover what we see as some of the things you should be doing. It's, we're calling it the container security model. Hopefully it's helpful for you. We're gonna talk about shift left, shield right, as I mentioned. And then, oh sorry, I went already out of frame. Thank you. Uh, and some best practices across the whole life cycle. So here's the thing, right? Containers, you might have security issues for, for a number of reasons, but one is, based on what's inside your container. Maybe some things that you've done that are not uh, probably the right thing to do when building your containers. And other times it's more not about necessarily what you've done, but in the surrounding environment, things that give access that probably shouldn't be there. So people being able to look in your, uh, the doors or going through a back door and whatnot. So um, that's kind of where we want to focus. And there's a lot of things happening in the industry, whether it's containers, uh, Kubernetes, cloud, that we need to keep pace with from the time we're coding all the way through the time things run. Because we are deploying a lot more frequently than we've done in the past, right? Uh, the number here is basically saying, hey, 60% of companies report that they were doing this either many times a day or, or every few days. And we compare to that to what many of us with either no hair or gray hair know, which is we used to do things more every four or six months, maybe a big release once a year. So we have to keep up with things. So how do you prioritize things without slowing yourself down? How do we detect and respond to issues that might, might take place? So let's talk first about shift left. It, it, you know, many of you uh, may be like me where you start to roll your eyes when you hear this term, but it's an important concept, which is essentially, look, let's, when we are developing, do the right things from the earliest point that we can to fix those things as early as possible so that when it rolls through, one, we're not stopped, our projects get delayed, or, and we want to prevent those things later on um, because it's costly to try and do it at a later point in time. And, so the better thing to do is handle it, and why? So what are some of the security issues that many of you are probably contending with? One is just simply there are so many logged CVEs that get reported back to us if you're scanning images. I ran into some of you yesterday who said, I don't even think we're doing that, which is you know, of concern. But there are lots of places you can do it. We'll talk about some of those ways that you can do it. The other thing is one of the reports that we did just studying our own Customers. So Sysdig runs a SaaS platform, and a lot of our customers are container-oriented. And we looked and to, to see uh, how many uh, customers were actually running containers as root. Now, sometimes you need to, and we'll talk about that. But 83% of the containers we were seeing were running as root. And that's quite per highly permissive and probably not the right thing to do. 
Um, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. The other issue that we see, and I think Alex, you wanna talk to some of this, is sometimes the images that we're starting with, because it's so easy to go grab an image as our base image and start building with it, that there are some things there that are, uh, that should keep us up at night. So you wanna come Yeah, yeah, I mean, basically what it comes down to is if you look at the contents of an image, there's a fair amount of stuff in there that um, uh, isn't maybe the greatest thing, right? You're, you're starting with an Nginx from some random spot on the internet, um, and when you go and use that in your, your overall infra, um, that saves you some time, but there's typically things in there that you might not already know about, right? So the first thing you should do is scan it, right? Look for what you might find misconfiguration-wise, vulnerability-wise. Um, and that generally finds about 90% of all the things you might care about. So things around like crypto jacking or around um, uh, embedding secrets or other like proxy stuff, you know, things that could uh, go wrong. But about 10% of the stuff within that container doesn't show up till it actually starts to execute, right? Till it actually is going at runtime. Um, so 90% is great, right? That's a fair amount of things, um, but there's still 10% of, of risks and threats don't show up till you're actually running your workload on that particular container. Uh, the reason that matters is a lot of that stuff has a pretty significant impact. So the report Eric was talking about, um, it actually shows that roughly um, a crypto miner takes about uh, $53 of your resources to generate $1 for them, right? So if that XM rig is baked inside of that image and it doesn't show up till runtime, uh, that's a pretty costly uh, outlay, right? So they're gonna make $1,000, you're gonna pay $53,000 you know, for that. Uh, so if you're not looking at these things in context of when it's being developed, when it's in your repository, when it's um, uh, being admitted to your cluster, you're, you're missing out on different key areas, and you have to keep that in mind as you go through that development life cycle. Yep, and we, um, a lot of this comes because we have a threat research team, which a lot of companies in our uh, org have, and they're discovering some of these things and writing a lot of interesting blogs to say, hey, we're seeing this thing happen, and a lot of it's in that 10% arena, right? So let's talk a little bit about build practices. We're gonna run through this quickly. We're not gonna show you the, the, the code and how to do it, but, but some of this is no-brainer stuff, right? But use trusted sources. Right? We wanna get images from known publishers, from trusted repositories, things like Docker Hub that has done the right thing with certified publishers that are, are also being scanned in those repositories to give you some idea of what's going on with them. I was listening to a customer call this week and uh, one of them said, yeah, and, and I had a, we're rolling out some stuff, one of our guys with a Helm chart, and he just had this line in there that said go pull this image that was just randomly, like bypassed all of the things, the security, getting it from some place that wasn't being scanned and so on. So these are the kind of things that you wanna avoid Right, just making sure yeah. it's trusted. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about making sure that you know your sources. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. One really low hanging fruit way is, you know, what's the distribution of the image? Is it some random Ubuntu image? Is it a UBI image? Is it coming from like uh, some commercial entity like a chain guard, right? There's a number of ways you can handle that to, to drastically limit the, uh, the attack surface of that particular container. Um, and it just puts you in a, an overall better posture as you start building that application out. Yeah. So th that one I think is pretty clear for most of you in the audience. The other is just avoiding unnecessary pri privileges. Don't run as root if you can help it. Now look, there are some times when that's needed. Uh, you know, in fact, there are some things that we do where to get the right level of insight, you need to have that container run as privileged, right? But um, you know, if that's gonna, if that's needed, also just make it writable so that it can't go uh, doing other things in, in the environment. Um, any other things to add? Uh, I mean, not really, it's, it's just be cautious, right? Um, if you, you wanna make sure you're at least specifi specifying who the container should run as, right? Don't just let it run as whoever it wants. Give it a particular username or whatever you use for those things. Yeah. Um, really, really low hanging fruit to, to make sure that the posture of that particular container is limited. Um, it might run into some issues, right? Permissions are a bear. They're never necessarily the most fun thing to deal with and we all have done the uh, Chamod 777 just to get you know, on with our day, but we probably shouldn't do that in production, so. Yeah. Great, and I think one of the things here, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but when I go grab an image for the first time, by nature of it, it's set as root, right? Um, often, typically you'll see a lot of images running as user 1000, okay. um, but so that's better than you know user zero, yeah. but. Great. The next one is a little more tricky, I suppose, but we wanna reduce the attack surface, and one of the things that will come out toward the end is that, um, you know, all these things that are ending up in my image that might be dependencies or other packages that maybe I inherited, or maybe you mentioned Nginx earlier, it's got things that I'm not even gonna use. Um, 
you know, when those things are vulnerable, uh, you know, you've got these, what we, we call bloat, right, of your image. You wanna be careful about that. Keep your images slim. Uh, this one is a multi-stage build. I, I don't quite understand this concept, do you? <laughs> Um, basically, it's just meaning like uh, layer on what's necessary as you need to, right? Like don't don't necessarily go get the thing that has everything under the sun that might you might potentially need at some point in time. Um, just you know start with something very simplistic and deploy what you need to to that image in in the, the layers that you need, right? Like it, it's just basically about keeping that thing minimal. Don't have it have everything under the sun. You probably don't need Netcat in your container. Yeah, it's cool, but it's also an exposure spot, right? So. Just make sure that you're, you're doing your diligence, do stuff in a way that makes sense, keep it slim, keep it, uh, keep it minimal. Yep, and you can start with some minimal images that are known, right, and there's all those, this concept of distro list as well, and at the end of the day, you know, certainly you don't want to expose a bunch of things like ports that are not even necessary for your app, right? Yeah. So a lot of things you can do to kind of make it so that there's less ways for adversaries to, to get to you and to do the, do the wrong thing, right? And we're talking about doing the right. right thing. Don't hard code credentials, you know, this is key, right? If you can, use some sort of external store. Uh, we just don't want those kind of things or like secrets inside of, of that. Even if it's expedient to do so, probably better not to because as soon as someone gets to that, they can start doing other. Yeah, I mean, that's really a best practice to start early and often, right? Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I have seen folks accidentally slip credentials into production because that's what the developer is doing on their laptop, right? That made it be simple. They could pass the test. They could get their stuff through quickly. Um, it's convenient. I mean, don't get me wrong, but you need to practice those, those pieces of hygiene at the very beginning, right? If you don't do that, accidents happen, right? It's, it's almost never malicious. A, a user isn't like, you know, in office space reliving their fantasy, going and stealing pennies from you, um, but they, they are just trying to do their job, right? And it's not, no one's really at fault other than just, you know, bad practices, bad hygiene. Um, and so it's just about enabling folks to do it the right way from the very, very start. Yep. Yeah, and, and clearly, you know, the next one, don't include confidential info. And one of the things is I was uh, preparing for this, we have a really good blog, which I'll point you to at the end, but it's like, yeah, there was some stuff in there and I thought I didn't have it in there anymore, but it's actually still kind of down there in one of the layers and, you know, that's, that, that stuff might still be in there of any confidential nature that you don't want. How many folks use in private registries, like on site or somewhere where you've got, yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, you know, it's good to have that, but it's also make sure, just like anything, you're using the right kind of permissions and things to, to keep that protected, to use the right kind of, you know, secure protocols for communicating with it and valid certificates and so on. Yeah, I mean, and don't be afraid to have a couple of reg registries, right? Like you might have one where you dump all of your artifacts, everything under the sun goes in there, and then you have one you keep all of your kind of golden images in, right? Your stuff that's running in production, maybe those come from a different registry than where your dev branches are, um, helps you have a certain level of rigor as you promote stuff through the process. Yeah, excellent. All right, so, so that's a little bit about uh, some of the things that we see as key, if you haven't been thinking about it in terms of build. There's also, you know, the ability to automate the checking of some of these things. So just in case we forget, uh, can we put something in place like a linter that will kind of warn us if we've not done the right things? Uh, so we're saying, you know, hey, there's something called Haskell Docker file linter, linter here, which can ex expose those, some of those issues to you, remind you before you actually get too far that these things are uh, not probably set up the best way. Some image scanners will also provide those insights to you. Like Sysdig does look at some of these things. Hey, this image is set as root. You can actually block uh, something from proceeding through a pipeline, for instance, um, by having that level of visibility and do that automatically beyond just giving you a readout of what's vulnerable, right? Uh, what are the, you know, that your configurations are off. Cool. All right. So now, without any judgment, how many folks think that in their org they aren't really doing scanning or at least not sufficiently of the images. <laughs> I saw you, so yeah, I mean, you know, and maybe, maybe it's with the nature of your business or the size or the speed at which you're working, but look, I mean, it's good to do this in some level or form. You know, there's a lot of registries that will have them built in. You know, if it's there, probably a good idea to go ahead and use it, whether that's something in the cloud or Quay or otherwise, right? Quay, I think, has Claire in it. Right? Yeah. Um, it's also available in standalone tooling, right? Uh, we partner with an organization called Sneak. We're now partnering uh, with uh, Docker Scout, 
and these are things that you can put in place to make sure that things are being scanned. And some of the advanced ones, and I know Scout is doing this, will say, hey, here's what we recommend, what you just can bump up to in order to address this. Um, what's cool is when you get a readout that says, if you just upgrade to this m minor revision, it will actually address you know, this many of the bones, like one, one shot and you're in much better shape from a security perspective. So those things can be really important or useful in terms of saving time. And I know Alex will help make the point about a lot of this isn't, it is about being secure, but it's also about saving you time. You wanna make some of those comments now? Uh, well, the next slide really brings that to bear. Okay, okay. Um, well, let me, let me mention like, and how many folks use like a CICD pipeline kind of thing, like a Jenkins or whatnot? Yeah, that's some of you, and some, some may not be doing that yet. But consider pushing some of this scan into that, right? So that when you're in something like a Jenkins or whatever it might be, you're getting these readouts right there, and you're addressing them before it actually makes its way down into your registry or repository. And we also um, believe that that's not the end of it all. So, but, but registry scanning, Scanning as you're building and those kind of things, there's a lot of tools that can help you get there so that uh, you can address these things quickly and not have someone tap you on the shoulder later on. And you should also consider around runtime. And I'll, I'll let you take yeah. that. Yeah, so where this really comes into play is that um, wouldn't it be nice if we knew exactly what was being used by an application? So um, from a developer's perspective, you often are starting with some sort of base image, you're layering your stuff on top that you know you need for your application to run, and then you're deploying into production. Inevitably, what ends up happening is you end up getting a laundry list of CVEs and vulnerabilities and things you have to go fix you know, two, three weeks, four weeks down the road. Um, and a lot of that comes from the number of images and, or so to say packages in that image that you're never actually leveraging inside of it. Um, there's some great technology coming out now between you know, people like Sysdig and some others that are doing this notion of runtime scanning. Um, and really what this is about is it isn't just scanning your image yet again. It's looking at the libraries within your image and correlating that to what's actually being executed by the container. Um, so if I built a custom image, I can figure out what, uh, what libraries in that image am I actually using to power my application. Um, so ultimately what it does is it allows you to basically say these 15, 20 packages, you know, these 30, 40, 50 libraries in those packages, these are the things that make up my core application. And then there's all these other libraries and all these other image or packages in here that are never ever being called, but they have vulnerabilities. So let's do two things. Let's create a report and let's draw a line between the stuff that's in use and the stuff that's not in use. Let's go fix the stuff that's in use and then tomorrow let's go remo uh, remove all the stuff that's vulnerable that is never actually being called by the application. So what that ends up doing is that means the security personnel aren't giving you a list that's you know, 50 pages long of vulnerabilities because you've limited the scope to just the stuff that's actually running in the application. And so your next iteration cycle, your next patching cycle, um, your, your footprint is significantly lower. So that first time, it's still somewhat arduous, it's still fairly long, but instead of fixing it, you're removing all the fluff you're not using. And then the next time, you're only getting reports on the stuff that actually is in use by the application. So it saves the developer time, it saves security personnel time, it gives you more time in your day to do the stuff you actually care about, that's you know, adding value to your company, not just patching the stuff you've already done. Um, so that runtime element is, is really, really intriguing because it's how we can basically help you scope down the, the potential risks within that image and then be able to go forward only doing th things that actually matter. Very good, and let's put a finer point on it. Um, you know, this is another thing that we, we saw and why this is so hard and why you're overwhelmed potentially with these CVE reports that come back at you is that there's a lot there. So a lot of our customers, the first time they're using an image, they're scanning it, there's a lot of high and critical stuff. And it's like, oh, you know, how do I even deal with this? And part of that challenge is that every day there are more and more CVEs being logged, given a number, being reported, and that's where the runtime element comes in. Um, because it becomes this kind of whack-a-mole scenario. So Alex gave, um, gave away some of the punchline, but we do want to look at severity. Like a lot of folks will just address the highs and criticals. They want to know if there's an own exploit. If there isn't, no, there's no, it's vulnerable, but there's no way in the wild that we've seen anyone ever get to this to use it for bad purposes. Knowing that's important because you can then prioritize based on that. Is it exposed to the internet? What are they, uh, there's another term for that, I can't remember. But um, anyway, net-net is, 
is it even reachable? Reachable is the number, the word I'm looking for. Is there a fix, right? If I can't, if there's no known fix, I want to probably, you know, figure out what to do else to protect from that vulnerability or watch if that anything behavior of the known vulnerability um, is being exploited. And then, as Alex was saying, we're adding this new dimension of is it in use? And that's a SysDig tenant. If there's nothing else you remember about SysDig, it's, it's well, at the end, Alex will tell you about the whole platform, but is, is runtime, helping you with visibility around all things at runtime. And we use that to help prioritize. And many of you, if you're developers, you're more on the left side of this diagram, maybe some of the configs that we talked about permissions, but um, it, you know, along the way, depending on what you're working on, we use this concept of in use. In use can either help you decide what to deprioritize, or in use can help you decide what to shift and change, right? Uh, hey, I've been given, like, how many folks running containers in, like, the public cloud? A uh, couple of you, yeah. So, some reason I've been given all these permissions and I, A, never use them, or B, it's just, like, not needed to do my job. We're gonna help you understand that so that you can shift and change that. On the Vuln side, one of our customers is saying, hey, you're saving me a ton of time. And that's net-net to what Alex was saying. Um, and, and you wanna take this one. The question I got in the booth yesterday, and I recognize many of you I spoke with, they were like, how do you know? What's the secret sauce for Cystic knowing if something's running beyond just the container? How do you tell me, how do you know which packages are running? Yeah, so the way that we instrument is a little bit different than most. Um, we've taken a, a kind of a bottom-up approach for getting details out of the infrastructure. Um, a lot of this comes from our lineage, um, and so Cystic was founded about 10 years ago now. Um, and it was founded by the co-creator of Wireshark. Um, and so Wireshark was a fantastic tool when you owned the infrastructure to grab packets and see what was going on inside your applications. Um, the problem we set out to solve was how do you do that for the cloud when you don't own the infra, you don't own the switch, you don't own any of that stuff, you don't have access to a span port, you know, what do you do? Um, and so the, the solution we came up with was, well, you know, the least common denominator in the cloud then would be the operating system we're running on top of. So if we can go into the kernel and we can intercept system calls, we have the same level of granularity that we had with a packet. Um, and so we're actually arguably more granularity in some ways. Um, but the net net on it is that we're able to go in and see every single system call, every single process bond, every single file access, and we can correlate that back to the libraries, the packages, the things that it came from. And so it's letting us get really detailed information of the runtime workloads um, and see what was going on there. And then we kind of took it to the next stage saying, okay, that's great. We can see all this data for the running workloads. What about um, the cloud itself? What about the other SaaS services we're using? And so we took this same architecture about intercepting system calls to be able to go look at things like the Kubernetes audit log, the uh, cloud trail logs from AWS, or the similar logs from GCP or Azure, um, logs from Okta, all sorts of other sources in order to look for malicious activity in those concepts of streaming data. And so that's the entire engine we use is looking at all of this data coming in and looking at anomalous activity, right? You can almost think of it like how Snort looked at patterns and packets. Sysdig is looking at patterns and system calls and audit files and log files, things like that. Cool. All right, getting down to the, to the short strokes here, just to put a finer point on the container side, your container may look like the one on the left, but what if we can tell you which ones are being used and save you a lot of time, money, and effort and reduce some of the fatigue that you're experiencing. Now, just in the last few moments, if you missed it, though, this is part of if you plan to start to leverage something like Docker Scout, this is what we're bringing together with the folks at Docker, and we were super pleased to be able to announce this yesterday. Again, same value proposition. Probably the most important one is the bottom one, deliver secure images faster. And so what happens is this information gets sent over to, uh, or gets pulled by Docker Scout in the form of a VEX file, event vulnerability exchange, anyway. Um, and then you've got a, a, a vis visibility into, which looks something like this, which is the I can't go back. I know you're taking a picture. I wanted to get. <laughs> oh, that's Jason. Okay, Jason is my scout guy, by the way. Uh, my colleague on the scout team. Um, net net is to be able to get a clear vision into what's actually impacted because somebody can get to it, uh, and what's just sitting there dormant, right? And and so that's key. And you can even just like you know. And what we love to see is that moment where you. You're staring at it with dread, and then you go, show me just the stuff that's impacted or affected, 
and that number gets a lot more manageable and we're a lot happier. So that's the, that's the key message about cysting and Dr. Dr. Scout I wanna, wanna give you. Now, last thing we mentioned earlier, shift left, shield right. What is shield right all about? For some of you, this will be in your domain. For some of you, it, it will not be in your domain. But either way, it's an important concept. Alex described the how. But runtime threat detection is really all about when that thing that you built is now running in a, uh, in a Docker node or some cluster of some sort, right? We want to watch for the thing. All the best vulnerability management in the world will not prevent some of the bad behaviors. And that's the, also the things we want to watch for. Or again, this can be your safety net for when I can't fix that vulnerability, I'm going to watch for what is it might be the expected outcome of somebody trying to exploit that and doing things. So let me, uh, let me have you kind of talk through this one. Yeah, I mean, it... Right. <laughs> that was scary. Um, really, it's just all about how do I deal with these, uh, these runtime threats and how do I figure out what is potentially at risk in my environment. Um, maybe if I step this way so I'm not in line with... There we the go. Seat. We'll shift, shift positions. Yeah. Um, the, the, the concept is that if I've got a running container and I've got things that are exposed, you know, I would need to look for stuff like crypto mining. I need to look for data exfiltration. I need to look for insert random, you know, MITRE term here, basically. Um, and being able to have a, a runtime threat solution for that is, is rather, rather interesting, right? It's rather necessary. Um, think of it kind of like EDR, but for the cloud. Um, and that's what we're trying to fit into that space is to help make sure that your stuff when it's running uh, isn't at risk, isn't exposed. And then we're trying to take that data and give it back to the developers, give it back to the folks who are building the application so that they can basically do better, spend more time doing what matters. Um, partnering with people like Docker allows the developers to get that data early and get it often um, to help avoid the potential risks in the future. Great. Do me a favor, summarize this. <laughs> Yeah, so this is just basically a, a notion from Sysdig here that our, all of our stuff that we're doing is basically looking at a CNAP portfolio from a runtime perspective. Um, be that CSPM, be that KIM, um, be that uh, CWPP, you know, whatever random four-letter acronym that Gartner has decided that it's called, um, we're looking at those things from a context of how can runtime make this better. Um, the, the whole goal we have as a company really is to effectively save people as much time as we possibly can. So we talked about vulnerability management ad nauseum. It's not really that different when it comes to the other pillars. If we talk about things like, uh, like Kim um, looking at uh, user permissions and resource access inside of cloud infrastructure, if we can look at the runtime logs, you know, things like CloudTrail, we can see what users are doing, what they're accessing, what they're touching, and then we can suggest proper permissions and proper data sets for those different roles. Um, so if we can look at the user access in a runtime context, we can obviously be able to say, well, this user was never actually accessing these regions, never using these permission sets. Let's pull those away. It's not that we don't trust the user, but if that user's credentials get exposed, the tokens get out there, it's that blast radius they can influence, right? So let's limit those things based off of that runtime data. Um, sound sufficient? Sufficient. All right, so we, we brings it to our last, and we'd be happy to take a few questions. There are microphones in case you want to do that. One, like, look, look, you know, let's stay secure, but let's make sure we have time to innovate. Uh, I stole this, Jason, from the uh, Docker Pay at Home page yesterday. Build secure software from the start. It's what, you know, we all want to do that in the spirit. We just, it can't be onerous, right? And, and that's uh, where a lot of the things that we do that Docker Scout is helping you with as we move forward is important. Shift left and shield right are both important. Shift right might not be in your purview, but it's somebody who's concerned about the production running environment is. So let us know if we can help. The other, the other thing, so I invite you to ask any questions that you have in the few moments we have left and to visit us out there. Many of you already have, so thank you for that. Um, all right, that's okay. closing. Thank you for being in the audience. And uh, oh yeah, the resources. We've scratched the surface, but there's a lot more extensive details in our blog. Uh, um, you, know, uh, you can search Dockerfile to get the one where we're talking a lot about what are the things that you should be looking to do correctly in a Dockerfile. The other one is more of an extensive best practice for container security, which would include the shift right. All right? Cool, any questions? You wanna use the microphone? Test, test, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so a lot of people may know that security teams have a big, con big issue. It's a long-standing, long-standing enemy relationship with containerization um, for various reasons. And it seems up until this point, security has been strongly lacking in containerization for a, for a while. 
Um, and it's, uh, it seems almost like a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to SysDig and Docker Scout now coming out for your container scanning. Um, my question is, is the security framework standards like ISO 2701, uh, CMMC, are these going to be met with SysDig and Docker Scout? In part, right? So they wouldn't, you can't say that I'm running these two things, therefore I'm compliant, but they are part of your artifacts to state why you are compliant, right? There's going to be controls and things you have to do that are outside of just scanning or reporting or getting that data set. Um, but these would be um, artifacts within your control framework that you use to become compliant with those standards. Okay, so this will make security teams a little more happy with containers? Security teams will be more happy. That's and, what it comes down to. And one of the things we've done in SysDig is a, across the whole spectrum, so from the time we're trying to scan things to posture management to the runtime, is depending on the thing, right? Well, in the middle of the posture, like there's a report for ISO 27001, and by the way, we'll check your environments, typically cloud-based, right? Could be on-prem, OpenShift, things like that. But um, hey, here's the reds and here's the greens. The greens, you forget about, here's the red, you, and here's the specific thing that you're not doing. You're not running, what's the uh, shield? No, I don't know. There's some things you want to have flipped on and, and maybe you're not doing it correctly, right? And so there's that, but on the scanning side, hey, if you need to be ISO compliant, these are the things you should have in place. And on the runtime side, if this thing triggers, this policy that we've given to you, you should know that you're probably violating ISO or PCI or whatever the standard it is that you're trying to meet. Yeah, and really what it comes down to is there's, there's a lot of ownership of those compliance specs as it relates to vulnerability management, particularly in containers. And you probably have had to deal with like, well, I can only have you know 50 criticals within this environment in this particular scan. And if I have more than that, we're gonna fail our audit or whatever it might be. And so you end up spending a bunch of your time trying to de-risk the particular critical, the, the particular high vulnerability that you see. And that's where that in-use concept comes into play because basically we can prove that, well, yes, this is a high vulnerability. It's never actually being called. And so we can de-risk that from a high down to a medium in our framework based off of this particular reason. Um, and then better yet, you know, the next time we scan it, it won't be there because we're going to remove it in the thing in the first place. Um, and so as much as I hate it, a lot of those policies come down to basically counting criticals, counting highs, you know, what is our, our limit at because we have a certain tolerance we can have or not. Um, it's, it's silly, but that's the way the auditors look at it. And I do agree with you, by the way, that sometimes the container side was sort of off to the side and security people weren't coming into play. That has been shifting, especially over the last 18 months. Like, we're seeing more security teams, and it might, might vary on the size of your organization and so on, but that are getting really engaged in cloud native Cloud especially, but cloud native as well. Um, so Yeah, it's, it's where that whole shift left thing really comes into play. If you can partner with your security team early on container development, your life is going to be a lot better because they're going to understand it better. Hi, uh, it, you showed one of the slides there with uh, eBPF probe. Um, can I, I just want to ask two questions on that. The, uh, how does it work if it's just a probe? Is it just like and doing any enforcement or is it just observability? And second, if you have, let's say, like Cilium also running and also working, you know, at the kernel level, I mean, does, how, how does that coexist? Yeah, so um, in the case of eBPF, everything runs in its own little, like, memory space. Like, think of it almost like, uh, it's a bad analogy, but kind of like the JVM. Um, eBPF runs in its own little containerized um, location, and it's not interfering with adjacent eBPF applications. So they can coexist. There's nothing wrong in that front. On the SysDig side, we run as a read-only process. So it's a non-blocking read that we're doing when we're pulling data out. Um, so there isn't any direct enforcement inside of eBPF itself, and you never should. Like, you shouldn't be doing write access to the kernel. That would be very, very scary. Um, and I would recommend, the, like, running away from anybody doing that. Um, maybe not NVIDIA, because they make you. but. Um, but the, uh, the, the core tenet there is that all of the reaction, all of the enforcement on stuff that we see happens um, after the fact or in line with. So like there's a container drift policy in the SysDig interface that says if I have a container that suddenly had something new added to it after it's been running, I can choose to either stop that container or I can choose to kill the process or I can choose to prevent the process running in the first place. So what happens in that case is that the 
container does the thing, the system call is evoked, sysdig sees it, the agent reads that and says, oh, I have to prevent action against this particular thing. I'm going to go kill off that with ptrace or something like that. And so it's, it's all done in line, and so it's not happening at the kernel specifically because we don't ever want to write to the kernel. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes it. And second question, um, you mentioned about compliance packs, like PCI and everything. Let's say you have your, like the CISOs have their own compliance and they don't want, like if it's a banking application and they have CID data and they want to be able to check, okay, if, if that data or if this got accessed across some network, can you come with your own policies enforcement? Yeah, so to a degree, um, everything we do in Sysdig is based on open source. Um, and so uh, the runtime engine is Falco, the CSPM engine is all written in Rego. Um, all of our enforcement from like our image controller is in, um, uh, in Rego as well, right? So all these things are in open standards. And so in a lot of it, you can certainly bring your own policy and run it. There are certain areas of the product where you can't completely bring all of your own stuff, but you can customize what exists to fit your particular controller requirement. Um, most of that limitation is within Rego, um, because let's be honest, it's a really complex uh, syntactical language, and we don't want to have people run stuff that's going to fail, uh, for the most part. And so we, uh, we have um, a number of policies that are highly customizable that you can use as kind of your base effort. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And by the way, since you asked about EBPF, I want to make the offer to you and anyone here, if you didn't get one, there's a pretty chunky book, so maybe today's the right day to pick it up so that you can take it home, uh, about the eBPF kind of concept. It's not about SysDig, it's really about eBPF, right? Yeah, so we, um, were, we were heavily involved in eBPF very early on um, within the, the Linux kernel itself, and so we have some, some of our employees were folks who were helping originate a lot of that code, translating it to Linux, and then going and executing that stuff, and so we've got some really fun resources on that. Conversely, it might help you sleep better on the plane, so. <laughs> And by the way, EBPF, for those that don't know, extended Berkeley packet filter, which now has very little to do, if anything, with packets, Correct. right? Um, it's just a way to get and run these little programs at the kernel level. Cool. Well, thanks yeah. all for your time. Yeah, thank you all. We appreciate you being here. Enjoy the rest of the day. Launch is coming. I hopefully have good food trucks again. That was really good yesterday. So thank all right. you all. Thanks all. <laughs>